it all boils down to a very simple logic in Kaban, and that is that the number of things that are in progress cannot exceed certain number, and what the exact number is depends on the size of the team. But I don't understand how people miss that part, which is probably the most important thing about Kanban. It is about limiting the, the number of things that are work in progress. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 130, Signs of High Work in Progress. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your hosts, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Victor, do you ever feel like you're not making progress on any of your work? Sometimes. To be more precise, I think that in the past I had that feeling. Over time I learned how to split things into chunks that I can finish in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time. We're talking hours, days, week, top. So it sounds like you put a constraint on yourself and limited the amount of work that you would do. Yes. I mean, if you look at public work that we are doing, the difference would be, let's say, a book or a course that can be published while in progress versus, let's say, YouTube videos or this podcast, right? If, if you look at that type of work that we are doing, we have much bigger feeling of finishing things with YouTube and podcast than with courses or books because they're easier to split into small chunks, you know, kind of half an hour episode of something. And you know when you started, you know when you finished, and you have also that psychological element of, hey, I shipped this. Now I I switch subject from probably we're supposed to talk about software development to something else, but I think it's very similar. Hey, can, can we ship this, or can I ship this relatively fast? If I can't, then I'm almost inevitably going to have certain level of feeling of not getting things done. This episode is based on a tweet that I saw from John Cutler. And the link to this tweet will be in the show notes today. And it's titled, the tweet was titled, Signs of High Work in Progress. And he gives a list of, I'm not going to count them up, but let's call it 35 to 40 different signs that your organization might be struggling with too much work in progress. And also there'll be another link in the show notes about a blog post that was titled, and I love this, Can Bandoned. Oh, that needs to be the title of our, of this episode. Okay. Well, <laughs> we'll, tr- we'll try that. And the Can Bandoned post is by, I cannot find the author's name. Okay, this feels really bad. Please forgive me if you are the person that owns this thing, but you'll have the backlink, so it's good. But the way that canbandoned is defined, it's an adjective that is unresolved work, which has been created as part of a Kanban system. I should have said Kanban, I guess, but that sounds weird. Kanban system used in agile work practices, which was created over one year ago. You've never done this, have you? but has not been updated in over six months. I did that this morning. Here's some examples of usage. That work was canbandoned when Dave left. We decided to move to the cloud and canbandoned that work. That's just funny. I have too much new work to do and cannot deal with my canbandoned work. Again, the link to this blog post and the tweet are going to be here. Or down in the show notes, not here. Because here is where. Okay, it's in the show notes. I want to talk about a few of these 
signs of high work in progress. And sort and we'll probably tie it back to the Kanban and post. First one. Lots of starting, very little finishing. Bad. I don't know what to say. That's that's, that's just a very clear sign of poor management. Can we say poor management? I think management. I think I think management is a legal term for us to say. I think poor management is fine too. I just don't think management will listen to us anymore. <laughs> yes, because if management is whatever management is, product owner, product management, executive management, whatever it is, whoever the forces are that are generating the work, if they're generating tons of new work but nothing is ever being finished, let's think about it this way. You you actually brought it up at at the beginning of the episode. Books and courses versus the podcast and videos. I can't tell you before we started this podcast in 2019, how many times I would start doing a podcast and never get a single episode out. I had like seven or eight just partially done, but it never shipped. You might have listened to a a recent episode where we're talking about software development versus software delivery, sort of in the same vein. If I'm building something and I never ship it, did it make a sound? You just said a great example of poor management, except that in this in that story you were both the doer and the manager. And the manager, yeah. So that 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 is really poor management, and there are typically two main things that create such type of problems or obstacles: is that you are pulled by yourself or by some a different person into doing something else before you finished whatever you were doing, right? Or that you had to switch to something else because finishing whatever you're doing has uh, an external dependency. And in both cases, poor management because either management pulled you away from whatever you were doing into something else or management did not remove the obstacles so that you could not finish that, then you were forced, you chose yourself to do something else. Organization of tasks and removal of obstacles are probably the main pillars of management. Whether you do it yourself, whether you're your own manager or you have a designated person, unrelated. This is sort of the same thing as we're running kind on our laptop and an IDE, right? I could, I could move that kind VM off to somewhere else. That would be the manager. Okay. Exactly. The, the analogy is actually falling apart, but it's, <laughs> it's okay. Okay. So lots of starting, very little finishing. So the corollary to that would be stop starting and start finishing. And there is a third element. Is this finishable relatively fast? Right? What because if it's not? It, uh, again, poor organizational skills. Because there is... Everything, almost everything. Let, let's put almost, just in case, kind of like, so that somebody doesn't start screaming at us. But almost everything can be split into chunks that are doable and finishable in a relatively short period of time. Now, that might not seem like that because the existing processes, the existing tooling, the existing administration, what's or not. But then we are going back into removing obstacles. And there is no excuse Hey, oh, I agree with you, right? But I, as the person who organizes all that, have no power over that. Your job is to remove it, figure it out, type of stuff. Make an executive decision. But there is always a way how to split it into smaller pieces. Okay. So that was one of the items. Lots of starting, very little finishing. Here's another one I liked a lot. Status check meetings with very little progress to report. That's just how the previous ones are manifesting themselves, right? If you're doing a lot of starting, a little finishing, then yes, which progress are you going to report? And I'm especially annoyed when I see progress like, hey, we finished 37% of development of this, or we executed 47% of the test cases, things like that. To me, that's kind of like status report I'm, I'm not really interested in. Those are random numbers. I, I'm really into is it, kind of to me statuses are pending. We did not that's in a in a backlog, let's say. Working on it, finished. Those are the only three statuses there are. There are no others. The way I also look at that, the the, the visualization I get with this is 
little progress to report this thinking about the high work in progress. I'm thinking about plates spinning on a stick and all of a sudden we've gone from one to two. Now we have 10 plates spinning on sticks and all we're doing is trying to keep the plates spinning. We're not actually trying to get the plates off the sticks and put them on the shelf where they belong. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So I thought that one was funny. Very little progress to report. Another one that I love because I have done it. The use of back channels to get work done. We were blocked, so I went off in XYZ. I've used back channels within the past week. Now, not because I was being blocked by any... Well, I wasn't necessarily being blocked. It's like, I don't need to go through the politics of this. I'm just going to go ask. And then I can decide, okay, now I'll go play politics to make sure that it's you know backtracked correctly. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you use back channels or official channels or whichever channels you use, right? As long as you get the work done, whatever is the most efficient way. Back channels, I love back channels. I think that back channels are absolutely, I think that everybody should be using back channels, if you ask me. There is nothing wrong with me just, you know, pinging directly Dave and kind of like, hey, can we do this? Yes, yes, okay, no, no, blah, blah. and uh, me and Dave do it. That would be back channeling, right? Yeah, and when people ask for the status, like, we finished that five days ago. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe not, maybe not go to ex, to extreme, not tell anybody type of stuff until we are asked. But yeah, back channeling is great. I think that direct communication. People confuse direct communication and think that that's something bad because you did not go through the official channel. You did not open a Jira issue, right? Or or you did not ask Joe, who is supposed to. This is actually a good one. You were never supposed to go directly to Dave. You were supposed to go to Joe, who, who was supposed to go to Dave. For you. For you, exactly. Yes, those were always fun ones too. Okay, so that one was, what was that? Oh, use, use of back channels. Here's another one. I actually want to cry a little bit for this one. Limited focus time and limited blocks of flow. This is the plate spinning thing again, right? I only have so much time until I have to get over and get that, that plate spinning again. Yeah, that'd be limited focus time is precisely the problem of starting too many things and not many being finished. Focus time is basically the ability to work on something until you finish, then switch to something else. It all boils down to a very simple logic in Kaban, and that is that the number of things that are in progress cannot exceed certain number and what the exact number is depends on the size of the team. But I don't understand how people miss that part, which is probably the most important thing about Kanban. It is about limiting the, the number of things that are work in progress. And if you say five things are in progress and you're blocked on all five, there is no other way to progress but by either going to vacations or removing the blocker so that one of those five can be finished. But what do most of us do? We go and grab a sixth one and put it in progress. Exactly. So we are very often using the style of presenting the work items without adopting the logic behind it, right? Can, almost every many of us are using Kanban boards, but very few are applying Kanban to those boards. And that's kind of a problem. It's a very, very simple rule. There is a certain specific maximum number of items that are marked as work in progress. And there, there, there is one solution to, to that. Sometimes you reach the maximum number of things that are in progress and you cannot progress because they are blocked and you cannot unblock them. And you know what you do then? You remove one of those. Say, we're not going to do it. So either you need to unblock it or you say, okay, I'm going to close this. And then when you say that, you're going to set off fire alarms for certain people. But come on, you know, those things that are in progress for, uh, what did they say the other one, for a half a year, a year? Oh, for a year and hasn't been touched in six months. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is, does anybody hope that somebody is going to continue work on that something after a year as if nothing happened? That somebody is going to start over that work after a year. I can guarantee you that. There is kind of close to zero or zero amount of work that 
can be continued on. So remove it, delete it. It's the same thing like when we talk about that one test that is always failing, remove it. Yeah, remove it for now, create a backlog item for it. It's just setting a backlog. And then if you decide one day, you know what? Let me go take a look at that, right? You'd pull it into work in progress, spend an hour on it. And if it's no good, put it back to the backlog, right? I'm That's not sure even about that. I'm not sure. I think that, so yeah, work in progress, you cannot progress without, after reaching a certain number. Things in backlog, if it's in backlog for a year or two years or for a very long time, I think you should remove it from the backlog completely. Delete it as if it's non-existent because obviously it's not that important. And if it becomes important in the future, you're going to start over anyway. So kind of like, and your software changed, your system changed in a year. I mean, how value, valuable is a backlog item from a year or more ago? So you're saying get rid of it completely, or are you saying get it off? Get rid and of it. Would you log it anywhere else just as a... No, delete it. Okay, delete it. All right. Delete but, it. And I if mean, it's important enough, it'll come back. Exactly. It will come back, and the situation will be different almost certainly anyways, because the system changed in a year or more, right? It's not going to be the same context anyway. There is an issue in, in Docker, in Docker's form, uh, where I was involved, that... Every once in a while, somebody posts a comment. It's been there for three years. doesn't matter what the issue is, but it's been there for three years, and I've been begging them, close this so that I, I really don't want to see this ever again. You obviously don't want to work on this. And that's okay. There is, I, I never judge people for saying this is not important for us, community, company, whatever. It's perfectly fine. What I get really disappointed when you say, no, 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 we want to keep it because... This has importance for us. Because whenever you say keep it uh, open, I assume that you mean that there is a, you, you attach certain importance to that something. And then you're basically almost insulting me for not touching that for years. It's a much clearer situation when you, when you make a statement. By de deleting that item, work item, after being on hold for a long time, you're making a statement, this does not matter. There are so many things that matter. This is one that is so low on the, the list that we're going to delete it. I think that that's a wonderful statement and sets certain expectations. We went all over the place, that one being based <laughs> on limited focus time and limited blocks of flow. And that what we talked about covered another one that was habit of taking on new projects due to regular blockers or delays, you know, it's there a lot of things that we just went through there. Now, one thing we didn't talk about, and this one's probably going to set off some people, the use of vendors to quote unquote, take up the slack managing vendors increases work in progress. I don't think so. I mean, no, no, let me clarify. Yes, that's happening very, very often, but again, it's not the use of vendors. It's a poor organizational skills. So sometimes, yeah, you need more manpower to do something. Excellent. But the same logic still applies. You need to organize things. You need to figure out what to do. And you need to finish it. If you need more people, vendors, whatever, hey, and you think that that will help, sometimes it doesn't. Just to clarify, putting more people to the problem doesn't help always. But again, you're still facing the same problem. Let's say you're a 10 people company and you never finish something. Making it 20 people company will not make you stop not finishing something. Now, if you are 10 people company who is finishing things, but not fast enough, then adding more people could solve the problem, right? But if, you, if one person is not finishing two, two are not going to change that. I'm also going to say that if you are a 10 person company and you go to 20, that does not mean you're going to get it done two times faster. Judging on our it current just, co conversation, that the only thing you're going to accomplish is to accumulate double the, the, the amount of work in progress things. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I think, and you were talking about the organizational challenges. If you chose to go with a vendor, nothing wrong with that. But if the vendor that you chose was just a body shop that was outsourcing to other subcontractors, basically agency model, you're going to be hosed because you're not actually talking to the people that do it. So if I was to bring in somebody, I would bring in a boutique that controls their people. 
right? And that's okay. Now they might outsource a couple of the small pieces and that's okay because probably the people that they're outsourcing to are people they outsource to all the time, right? It's they understand their organization and they can do it, but that's pretty few and far in between, especially in large organizations. What's the funniest situation or the saddest, depending on how you look at it, when you increase the headcount, right? Through vendors or what's not, right? And basically increase the headcount of that manager, which, with which you're basically saying, hey, you're not capable of making five people work, so we're going to give you 10. Yes, it's, it's <laughs> horrible and sad all the same. It's like, look, you're, you don't have an MBA, right? You have a master's, right? You do have a master's in archaeology. Ah, uh, you're asking me. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, yes, me. yes, 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 in archaeology. So, yeah, you don't have an MBA. You're not a master's of business administration. You have a master's in archaeology. Well, boy, that could open up a whole other can of worms. <laughs> I am not a business person. I am not a marketing person. But to me, if somebody's not capable of managing five people and then all of a sudden you give them double the amount of people or even worse, quadruple the amount of people, and you're expecting them to be successful as executive leadership, you need to get your brain checked. I'm sorry. That's that's just, you're setting up everybody and your whole organization up for failure. So not opposed to use of vendors, but again, if you're not organizationally capable, it's probably not going to work out good. I want to do one more. And again, the link to this tweet and the link over to the Kanbandon, which I love that. I don't know how to really say it, but the link for both of those will be in the show notes. Here's the last one. I'm now Lower wondering tr- whether it's going to be the one I want to talk about. Let's see. I, well, do you know, are you looking at this or are you just listening to me? I'm listening and looking. Okay. All right. Well, why don't you tell me the one you want to talk about? Rush the kickoff. Okay. That wasn't the one, but I'm okay with that one. Let's do that one. Cause that, that was on the, my short list too. So rush kickoffs. In quotes, because we got a late start. Why would that person do a kickoff in a, to begin with? Because obviously, if you rush it, you 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 are basically saying, "Hey, we need to do it faster because we are late, and kickoffs are not really helping us go better and faster, right?" Because that's what you're saying. Kickoffs are really not providing value. They're not really making the project be more successful, go faster, what's or not. So you're basically saying that kickoffs are not providing value. So let's rush them, right? That's, that's basically it. It's silly. This is the way I think about it. This is like me saying, oh, the podcast comes on on Wednesday at 6 a.m. It's Tuesday at 8 p.m. I haven't even started editing yet. I knew it was coming out on Wednesday. It's my fault for not doing that. But the problem is we believe that we've got to push it down on everybody else. This is the case of just because this is an emergency for you does not make it urgent for me. Rushing things, it's its a bad thing. Okay. Actually, I lied. I want to go ahead and throw in the one I was thinking because I think this leads into it. Yeah. Lower trust levels. Calls for <laughs> accountability and calls for predictability. Yeah. Give, please, please leave. Kind of like, you know, I, I cannot do this anymore, really. But, but if I if I ever again get into the situation that we start getting accountability and predictability and other blame techniques, I promise this is now to my current and all future employees. I'm going to leave immediately. Kind of, I, I cannot work anymore in environments where where we know we're going to fail, and then we are preparing. Then instead of Trying to reverse reverse that, trying to succeed, we are spending valuable time trying to figure out how not to be guilty for that happening. One of the cases where I got really disappointed and eventually left the company was precisely that. Incident in production. I'm a tech lead of a team. Things happen. We start fixing it immediately. And then I get pulled off to justify to the customer why this is not already resolved. I do it. Same day, a couple of hours later, another with the same customer, hour long meeting to justify again why it was not already fixed. And in one moment I had to say kind of like, it's not fixed because 
you're wasting my valuable time. You're trying to figure out how to blame me for something that we did not resolve yet. Blame me afterwards. <laughs> Once we fix it, <laughs> we can have as many meetings as you want and you can throw all the stones you want, but you cannot start throwing stones at me for being at the crucifixion instead of being in mines and then or wherever the work environment is and then doing the work. This is the case of, look, do you want me to fix it or not? If you want me just to sit here so you can yell at me, that's great, but that's not going to get anything fixed. You can't say it that way, unfortunately, but that's what you're thinking in your head. The whole story behind it is because management in that company, not the customer now. I mean, customer is going to always freak out whenever something goes bad, right? But yeah. the management in my company, they were focused on shifting the blame instead of fixing the issue. When you get into blame shifting, it's a no-win game. Why, why waste the time? It's just... Uh. That's the whole point of calls for accountability and other realities. Just run. Run fast, run far. Okay. So I do want to flip over to Kanban real quick. I'm going to see if there was one more thing here that I wanted to see. Okay. So, and this is a fairly short post, so you'll be able to read this one pretty quickly, but it gets down towards the end. This started discussions about why work was being kanban and the common themes were, and there were five. I'll read them real quick. Too much work was being assigned. Makes sense. Pointless work was being created. <laughs> you never have done pointless work, have you? Lack of discipline around managing work. No work in process limits at a personal or organizational level. No limits. Finally, this was good. Assigning work to the wrong people. This included unresolved work being assigned to people, you ready for this? <laughs> who had left the organization. <laughs> You're in JIRA, you've got the ticket, and you assign it to somebody that already says, no longer in the organization. Exactly. And that person, that manager, definitely needs more people not to, not to know. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that last one was just perfect. Well, I signed it to Dave. Dave left three weeks ago. Oh, I didn't know that. He reports to you, right? Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't be a manager anymore. This was, in my head, one of our more fun episodes. You as a listener, what did you think? Go over to the Slack workspace, look in the podcast channel. You'll see a post for this one. It has something to do with work in progress. I don't remember what it says right now because I haven't come up with the title as I'm talking. So check it out. Leave some comments. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox. Thank you.